we gon' drop this one like this, y'all. I know you didn't see it coming. Here we, here we, here check we go. it, check it. Sunday morning, I have something to look forward to. I'm getting excited cause I know the thing is gonna be right. People see me, they don't understand the fire in me. I just tell them, come join me at Delta Bay COC. We come together where believing is belonging. The love of Christ is something we'll continue sharing. We come together where believing is belonging. Upon His word is where we will continue standing. I can lift my hands, I can shout amen. I am free to give the Lord praise. We're a family. Through Jesus Christ, you'll see the love we show will keep you amazed. We come together where believing is belonging. The love of Christ is something we'll continue sharing. We come together where believing is belonging. Upon His word is where we will continue. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Sitting in the upper room with his disciples. And Jesus is there and he's sharing a meal and a message before facing his impending misery. Jesus knew at this table that there was a doubter, a denier, and that there was a deserter there at the table. Yet Jesus did not dismiss any of them from the table. But what Jesus decided to do is he communed with the corrupt. He knew that his betrayer was there at the table. Matter of fact, Judas was sitting right alongside of him. Because he says, the one who dips his chips in my dip is the one that's going to betray me. And in order for you to dip where Jesus is dipping, that means you had to be in close proximity to him. You see, betrayal does not happen uh, by somebody that you don't like. Uh, betrayal does not happen by somebody that is distant. But betrayal usually happens by somebody that is right alongside of you. Jesus, Paul says, on the same night that he was betrayed, he took bread. You see, he never dismissed Judas from communion. As if to say, Judas, the whole time that you are betraying me, I am still blessing you. So Jesus knew that he was there. He kept him there because he understood I'm sacrificing for you while you are busy selling me out. And so he tells Judas while he's sitting there at the table, he says, Judas, go and do what you do quickly. I know what you're about to do. You're going to sell me out. Go ahead and do what you do quickly. But he, what he really was doing was giving Judas an opportunity to confess his wrong. He was giving Judas an opportunity to get right before it's everlasting too late. But Judas refused to do it. And Judas went ahead and dipped and then went out, had communion, and then went in the darkness of night to receive his 30 pieces of silver. The sad part today is we do the same thing Judas does, is we use communion as a cover. We cover under communion to do the things that we want to continue to do. 
Jesus came to him that night and was simply knocking on his door. But he wanted the appearance of holiness without the acquisition of it. And Jesus was knocking at his door, but just like we do, Jehovah's Witnesses on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock, we refuse to do what? Open the door. We just wait till they go away. You guys still with me? And so now, Judas goes out in the midst of the night. He goes searching for the green. He says, Judas, you can do that, but Jesus went searching for the glory. But in order to be glorified, he would have to be gutted. He would have to take the low road to a high place. So after the Passover meal is over, he tells his disciples, come with me. And all 11 of them at the time, he says, I'm going to take you to a secret place. He takes them to a place that they probably had been there before. He goes to the Mount of Olives, and right beneath the Mount of Olives is a quiet place. It was the place called Gethsemane. He takes them to a garden because it's all about to come to an end. Why does he take them to a garden? Because a garden is the place where it all started. It all started in the garden of Eden. It was in the garden that the first Adam took a fall. But it was in the same garden that the second Adam would take a stand. In the first garden, God sought man, but in this garden, man would seek God. In Eden, Satan led Adam to a tree that led to his death, but from Gethsemane, Jesus went to a tree that would lead to our life. Jesus is now in the shadow of the cross, and he's just moments away from the most excruciating death known to mankind. He decides to go to this garden, a quiet, serene place. Anybody in here have a garden in their home? Or you had a garden? You have a garden. And it's a garden that we go to just to get away from folk. It's a garden that we go away. It's the one place in the house uh, that you can grow your peas and your squash uh, and you can grow your, your sweet potatoes and you can simply have a little peace. It's a beautiful place. But what we see here is Jesus is bringing an ugly problem into a beautiful place. Church, have you ever had an ugly problem in a beautiful place? Have you ever took a nasty situation into a beautiful place. Some of you are in here this morning. You have an ugly problem, but you bought it into a beautiful place. Have you ever bought old mess into a new place? Have you ever bought some old circumstances into a new situation? Have you ever bought all that old mess up from the projects up and you bought it into the suburbs. Uh, and some of us bought all our stuff uh, from Frisco and Oakland and Richmond, and we bought it out to Antioch <laughs> to a beautiful place. You guys still with me? And we do these things. Uh, and some of you guys have blessed to get a second chance at marriage, uh, but you bought all that old mess from the first marriage uh, and old relationships, and then you bought it into the new marriage and you wonder why it's not working. Moved into a new home, but you still have old habits. So, when this happens, we seek a garden. We seek a garden because it is the garden that helps us to have peace in the time of pandemonium. And it is this place that does not eradicate my problems, but it is this place that helps me to endure them. And so Jesus goes to the garden, but the Bible says that when he gets there, you got to remember the context. The context says he goes to the garden. Turn me up on the mic. Come on now. I'm competing with nature. When he goes to the garden, he goes there 
at nighttime. And you know, sometimes we get some problems in the night. Sometimes it's our darkest night that will lead to our day. We go there at night because we can't see during the day. Sometimes in the day we have place, we have purpose. But at night, there's craziness and confusion. It is the dark that sometimes make us feel vulnerable in our lives. Uh, we, we, we feel messed up. We, 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 we can't see our own way at night. And, and it is sometimes only in the night times of our lives that we find the light of the world. And so Jesus, the text says, goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. Give me the first slide. Now what I want you to see is this. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Garden of Gethsemane is a, is a beautiful place. No slides? All right, there we go. So watch this. And this is how it looks today. It's a beautiful place. And you see right there in the garden there's a cross. Because Jesus was there at the crossroads in his life because he had to make a decision. Thank you, Jesus. He's there at the Garden of Gethsemane. And it was a place that he had to go to to get away from some haters. You see, the, the, like, as I said earlier, the, this, this garden was located right below the Mount of Olives. In other words, in order to get to this garden, he had to go high. Sometimes when you got to get away from some people, you got to go high because those same people will try to take you low. So he goes up high to this place. You see, the Mount of Olives is a ridge that is about 200 feet higher than the Temple Mount. And so as he is in the garden, he can oversee the city of Jerusalem. And sometimes you got to get away and you got to get to a place where you can just see your circumstances and you can oversee your situation and then you can look on high from divine point of view and look down low. You see, when you have problems in your life, sometimes what you got to do is you got to get high. Not the high you're talking about, you're thinking about. Uh, amen, because some of y'all were smiling a little too much here. You gotta, he said it now. He said you can, you can get high. But you got to go to a high place. And you got to look at your situations from a high point of view. And everything down low will look so minuscule. And so here he is. He's in this garden. And in the garden of Gethsemane are a number of trees. But the trees in this garden are not apple trees. Orange trees, peach trees. Some of y'all love grape trees. Amen, nothing wrong with perp. But the trees that are in this garden are olive trees, olive trees. Now, olive trees are interesting trees because it is a tree that can grow in places that other trees cannot. It is the type of tree that can grow in unproductive soil. That's the kind of tree it is. And so the Garden of Gethsemane is not a place where all the other trees want to grow. It's not a place of popularity. If so, all the other trees would have been there. It is not a place of success. It is not a place of always being happy. The Garden of Gethsemane is an interesting place because it's a, it's, it's a, it's a place that, 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 that can only be conducive to certain kind of trees, and that is olive trees. And sometimes in your life, you got to be like the olive trees. you got to be able to bear fruit when others cannot, and you got to be able to take root in hard situations. Sometimes in life, uh, uh, you may not like the house you're in, uh, and you may not like the marriage you're in, and church folk may start cutting up, but that's not time to leave. It's time to take root 
and bear fruit in places that other trees could not. And so now, here he is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Again, it is not a popular place because people love a popular place. You like it when it's gospel explosion. You like it when everything is packed, when everybody is smiling. But we're talking about a special place, the Garden of Gethsemane. You see, people love it when things are going well for them in their lives, when their children are shining, the church is thriving, their money is right, their marriage is tight. Everybody loves a prosperity place, but how many people can handle the pressing place? Gethsemane is a place of pressure. As a matter of fact, the name Gethsemane simply means oil press. It is a place of pressure when your next move will not uh, just determine your destiny, but your next move will determine the destiny of the disciples under you. You are in a pressing place. Anybody ever been in a place of pressure? Now, a place of pressure is tough because what you do not only affects you, but everybody else around you. That's a place of pressure. When you got to go to the hospital and they call the minister and you got to give somebody their final words before they enter into glory, it's a place of pressure. Anybody ever been the only breadwinner in the house? And everybody depends on them to make ends meet. And your children think there's a little man in the wall that, that turns on the lights and, and that, that toilet paper magically reappears and that just food just comes down from on high and money grows on trees. Uh, and you don't know how you're going to make ends meet at the end of the month. It's a place of pressure. Anybody ever been there? Ah, you may be one bad move away from bankruptcy. Uh, and maybe you have pressure. You got this one shot at this interview. Uh, young people, one shot at this exam. And this exam will determine what college you go to and the rest of your life, your earning potential, and all of your career opportunities. But you only get one shot. It's a place of pressure. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Pressure. Let me talk to the young people. Your boyfriend says, come on now, if you love me, come on now, we got I, I, I reserve this place under the bleachers for me and you. I got this. If you truly love me, you'll do this for me. Now, we laughing, but you've been there. It's a place of prayer, and it's not just the young ladies going through the prayer. Some of these young men, because these women, are, these young ladies are, whoo, Lord Jesus. they pressuring these young men to lose their virginity. And you got to say, all right, it's a place, and she's dropping it like it's hot, and she's showing you things. And you say, ooh, I ain't never seen one before. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Daryl, you laughing a little too hard. Your glass is fogging up, Daryl, you... <laughs> You all right? I ain't never seen one before. It's a place of pressure, Daryl. What you going to do? Uh, uh, and then you have to ask yourself the question, will I or won't I? Should I or shouldn't I? It's pressure, pressure. And it, now, let me tell you something. That is pressure. You get fouled. You're down one, two free throws. No time on the clock. It's pressure. Pressure. Oh, I love this. My son went to the free throw line last night, game tied. He had two free throws to go up one. He missed the first, looked over at me. I said, no pressure. He went and just sank the other one and said, <laughs> pressure. He gave me the L. I said, there it is. <laughs> pressure. Now, I didn't say we won the game because we had another half a quarter left, but he, we went forward. Pressure, 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 pressure. The place of pressure brings the best out of you. You don't know who you really are until you've been under some pressure. 
This is the place of pressure. Gethsemane means oil press. This is the place where olives trees grew and how they would get the olives down is they would come and they would hit the tree. Bam! Hit it. And then they would wait for the most ripe olives to fall down from the tree. And once those ripe olives that had reached their maximum peak, they would fall to the ground, they would be gathered. They would take those olives. Give me the next slide. What they would do is they would place it under a millstone. And they would take all of these ripe olives, because all you, you want the ripe olives. That's how you get the, the extra virgin oil. And they would take it. Give me the next slide. Watch this. They would take it and put it under a millstone. And they would take it and they would crush it. They would crush the olives. And then what you would get is the oil that comes from the olives. In other words, stay here. The olives had to be picked on, disconnected, bruised. You don't hear what I'm saying. In the prime of your life, picked and plucked in order for you to meet your purpose. Sometimes you got to be picked on, bruised, chopped up, letters written on, uh, people subtweeting, talking about you, backstabbed, all these things, crushed. All these things had to happen in order for some oil to flow freely from your life. Does this make sense? In other words, olive oil is only produced under pressure. And when the oil comes out, oh, you can do so many things with oil. In those days, that's how the lamps kept burning. In other words, when you got the oil, that means your light could shine just a little bit more brighter. Sometimes you got to be crushed, picked on, abused, and and, and talked about in order for you to have your light to shine just a little bit more brighter. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. <laughs> Oil was also used to anoint priests. So when a priest was anointed, they would take the olive oil and pour it on the head of the priest. In other words, that's how the priest got their anointing. Uh, you, If you want to be greatly anointed, you must be greatly crushed because the oil falls from the crushing. In other words, my anointing uh, did not come uh, from my degrees at Pepperdine. Uh, my anointing came from my crushing. Uh, and if you are in the Lord Church uh, and if you are preaching word of the salt, uh, you know a little bit about some crushing. You know how many people come and say, man, I wish I had your work, man. You got freedom to do what you, you man, y'all y'all can do this and, and do that. I wish I had, oh, I said, uh, you, you owe my glory, but you don't know my story. It came with some crushing. Does this make sense? Uh, see, my anointing ain't cheap. It came at a price. Does that make sense? Um, the greater the preacher, the greater the pressure. Does that make sense? My anointing costs something. The, the price is great. And too many people want this position, but they don't want the pressure. It comes with the pressure. This morning, I'm talking about a kingdom crush. You got to know what it means to be under pressure. But that's the only way the oil is going to flow. Does it make sense? So Jesus Christ is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows he's going to have to be crushed. That his suffering, his sacrifice on the cross will lead to him being crushed. But that was the only way the Holy Spirit was going to flow. That oil of the Holy Spirit was going to flow out at Pentecost. Is that he had to be crushed right there on the cross. As a matter of fact, you can't crush Satan unless you are crushed yourself. I don't hear what I'm saying. 
Genesis 3.16, the first prophecy in the Bible was that it would be the seed of a woman that would do what to the head of Satan? Crush the head of Satan. In other words, but you got to first be crushed in order to crush him. Does this make sense? And so now, you can never bring about healing to anybody else if you're not willing to be hurt yourself. Does this make sense? All right, now watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Look at verses 36. Say, start the text, Francis. We're going to get right through this, and we'll be done. Watch this. Verse 36. The Bible says what? Read, Daryl. Uh-huh. Mike 6, go ahead. Read. A place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here a while. He says, well, I go over there and pray. Read. Come on. He took Peter. Uh-huh. Read. Uh-huh. Read. Come on. Read. Then he said to them, uh-huh. my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. All right. Now watch this. Watch this. So Jesus takes his disciples. Going back to verse 36. To a place called Gethsemane. And he tells them, just sit over here while I go over there to pray. Notice how Jesus handled pressure. He handled pressure through what? Prayer. Prayer is not punking out. When somebody says, I'm going to go pray about it, it's not punking out. Prayer puts you in position to receive God's power. Now, there's certain situations you can praise through. But Gethsemane, you are not there to praise through. The only way you're going to get through Gethsemane is through prayer. Does it make sense? He says, sit there while I go over here and pray. And what he did is he had 11 disciples, but he didn't take all 11, did he? He says, one, two, three. Come on. Peter, James, John. He took his inner three. He says, come on. Why? Because not everybody on the team can handle pressure. You wonder why some of you guys are always the last one to know what's going on at Delta Bay? Because not everybody on this church team can handle the pressure. Join me at Delta Bay COC. We come together where believing is belonging. The love of Christ is something we'll continue sharing. We come together where believing is belonging.